All right, and we are going live with the huddle report on this wonderful Wednesday evening, uh, the evening before 4th of July. So I want to wish everybody that's watching in the replay a very, very happy uh, 4th of July. So as always, as we do with each individual stream, and I am coming in a little bit early uh, this evening as I did yesterday, um, planned on streaming at 8.30, was testing out Streamlabs a little bit, couldn't get the setting exactly the way I wanted it, so I'm back here with OBS, and so we will be using OBS uh, for this evening. Once I get done with this stream, I believe then I'll bounce into... Uh, the stream labs and we'll test it out so awesome check this out i had everybody just bought you know bounced in at the exact same time got xrp carolina got gaming crypto got zbits over here so let me uh take a moment and uh calibrate myself with my own youtube here so i can make sure i know what we're doing when we're doing it and make sure that we're actually getting a solid stream so, um, so far it looks like it's coming, uh, coming through, uh, fairly decently. It looks like the timing on the, uh, um, on the computer is also working pretty well. So what's up, Richter? How you doing? Uh, good to see you on. I've got all these devices. I feel like, uh, I've got my phone over here. I've got a backup laptop and I've got my broadcasting laptop over here in front of me. So trying to figure out what screen to look at. And it might be a little distracting here. So I uh, want to make sure we uh, we go through all of that. Hopefully everything's coming through loud and clear. Um, have a lot of great things to talk about today. Um, as always, there seems to be significant movement in the industry as a whole. Uh, significant movement uh, in the space uh, in, for, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, price movement. And I just want to observe and take a take a moment to look at this because what's interesting is that you know we had what 9500 uh on the on bitcoin just a couple days ago right now it's sitting just under 12,000. so there's a high probability chance we're going to hit the weekend we go through fourth of july people are home people are going to get on um not weekend but maybe through tomorrow we're going to see bitcoin go over twelve thousand dollars now, what I find interesting in all of this, and again, this goes back to stability. Not, we don't want big uh, volatility. We don't want big uh, price fluctuation uh, to what's good for the market, what's good for the investor, uh, what's good for growth and development is when we look at XRP and we see it sitting at a resoundly uh, 40 cents right now, drop down to about 39 cents, up to 40 cents. It hasn't fluctuated a lot. It's going up incrementally. And I think that that's really showing us significant stability uh, in that uh, in that digital asset and significant stability uh, for what we're going to uh, need in terms of uh, when we see full utility kick in. Uh, and so uh, remember that you know, when we look at digital assets, we want to look for utility. We want when we want to see movement in the digital asset. There's various. Uh, you know, variabilities, uh, so to speak, that we want to observe uh, that will push uh, a digital asset up. Obviously, some of that is speculation. We saw the big hype speculative uh, boom uh, back end of 2017, beginning of 2018. Uh, we saw a little tendency of that recently. Uh, what we want is the utility boost. We want to see uh, a digital asset. We want to see utility in the marketplace. We want to see acceptance in the marketplace. And we want to see regulatory clarity in the marketplace so all of those things are what it, are the are, are really the impetus or the, it's going to create the groundswell to begin this movement again when it comes to xrp we're so keenly focused on what's going on with xrp mainly because we're watching and seeing what ripple net uh, uh, uh what the ripple net capabilities are uh through what ripple is doing by adding more and more banks around the world to use their X current platform. And now seeing uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, the big buy into MoneyGram and the trend of what MoneyGram is going to create. Now movement of funds, movement of money, we don't wanna see big volatility spikes uh, in the price point. Now, obviously if we look back, we look at what, you know, what people would anticipate, what is needed for a full liquidity. Obviously from that perspective, many could then say, 
that the expectation or anticipation uh, for XRP to move up is real. Um, and so, yes, it can move up. But again, we don't want to see those big, uh, big spikes because every big spike has a cliff at the other end. And typically the cliff is as far down, if not further uh, than that initial spike. We want steady growth. We want uh, decent, de decent movements uh, upwards. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a lot of that happening within the space right now. And we've seen it with Bitcoin kind of, but the, but those movements are, are pretty um, overall. You know, if, if you're trying to day trade this, obviously you're going to get yourself in trouble. So that, that's not my thing whatsoever. So uh, again, what's up, Richter? Glad to see you here. Jay Hyatt, what's up? What's uh, on? C. Reed, uh, Sadiq, SRT, what's up? Uh, good to have all you all on here. So um, let's take a look at where we are. Uh, let's take a look at uh, who bounced in 600 plus XRP. Yes, imagine that. Imagine that day. Um, so great. We're going to let people roll in here a little bit more. Flooring Guy, glad to see you on. Richter Inc. You're branding yourself. Branding the Richter. Rich, rich, you can say, uh, rich tier, rich to Richter. <laughs> who was the, uh, who was the, the goalie, uh, Richter? That's all. Every time I see Matt Richter come in, I think of the goalie. I think it was the goalie for Long Island. I believe it was Long Island. Uh, I'm thinking about hockey, NHL. Anybody, uh, remember that? And I, I thought his name was Matt Richter. Maybe it was Richter, <laughs> the Richter scale, Mike Richter. That's it. The Rangers. There we go. I knew, I knew it was over there. Made more sense for it to be the Rangers. Um, so, yes, the New York Rangers, exactly. And it was Mike Richter. Every time I see Matt Richter come in, I think about Richter. And then I go back to when I was in, back in college. And I, I don't, we used to play Sega. We used to play NHL uh, hockey on the Sega. I don't know if any of you guys remember the Sega. And I just remember, you know, playing. And we had uh, certain, you know, certain uh, uh, players. We had Flurry. Um, and Richter, and I don't know, it's just those names. They just still you know, resonate, resonate in your, in your head. Um, NHL 93. Um, that's, that's the one that we, uh, that we played on. That was back in, back in the day. Man, I used to love, love it. Oh my God. That was the best. I think it was still one of the best, uh, hockey games that they had on a console. So I went over and tried to play it on the PlayStation. I remember hanging out with my buddies playing, uh, I think it was NHL 96. Um, and it just wasn't the same. It just wasn't there. So, <laughs> no, you don't play hockey. That's awesome. So, all right. Let's, uh, oh, look at that. We got more and more people bouncing in here. I mean, you know what? It was crazy. If you guys remember on Sega, I think it was after NHL 93, they took the blood away. And that, I think that was the best part. You would, you would, you would check, uh, check a guy, fall on the ice, wriggle around on the ground, and you'd see a stream of blood come out. I thought that was, that was the best. I think it was maybe 94. I don't remember if 94 was the last year. but I, I, And I might have brought it back afterwards. But I always thought that was awesome. And you could juke him. You know, you come in with a stick and around the net, you get it in the corner. That was awesome. <laughs> What's up, Whitefly00? Zero, zero. And haven't seen you on in a long time. So, all right. Uh, we got a ton of stuff to talk about. As always... Um, we're going to start out uh, the stream with a shout out to the first person uh, that came on. Uh, so person number one, let's see, let's scroll back up. Let's see, we got XRP Carolina, and that means we're going to shoot over. Uh, so, <laughs> this is like nine, Vepro's nice. That was awesome. <laughs> so funny, you know, as, as you get, uh, get older and then you look back, you know, over the years of what you remember when you were young and then people come on, they're like, oh, I was even a lot younger than that. Makes you feel, uh, I don't know, the whole, the whole aging thing in the years are kind of crazy. Swingers, exactly. That, Rock Roberts, man, that, that is totally legendary. And it's so funny because when I first watched that movie, that was like, that was us in college, you know, when we'd all hang out. We got to play hockey before we go out. And it was like that all the time. Man, that was awesome. Oh, that's awesome, man. Whitefly, I appreciate it. Glad to see you bounce in and, uh, and comment. Um, but that's, <laughs> that was like the best scene. Exactly. 
And if you guys, if you're too young and you haven't watched that movie, Swingers, you got to go back and watch it. That movie was actually, was absolutely awesome. That was a classic. Mr. BXRP, what's up, man? What's the biggest news of the day? Uh, man, you're on vacation. That's what it is. That's the biggest news of the day. You know, I wasn't on vacation today. <laughs> tomorrow, however. Tomorrow, going to Supercon. Never been to a Comic-Con in my life. Uh, bringing the kids over there. And it's going to be interesting. It's definitely going to be interesting. So, all right, what was I doing? All right, I, I was got sidetracked here. I'm looking at my YouTube video on my phone. I don't know why I'm doing that. I'm trying to open up the XRP tip bot. So here we go. We're going to throw this over there. We got to mix this up a little bit. Here we go. Um, let's see if I got you on here. Got to have you on here, right? Uh, there you are. Bam. Going to throw this in there. And just shot XRP Carolina some free XRP. First on, first on the chat. Yo, uh, Pickle Rick, good to see you on as well. I am dressing up just like this. Pretty awesome, right? <laughs> All right, that's awesome. Let's see. Um, where were we? Go back over here. Too many devices. I don't know how my son does it with all the devices around. All right, so let's let's start let's start this evening off. I want to dig into something that um, has come up uh, over and over again. A couple of things that we're going to talk about tonight. I want to talk a little bit about uh, banning, banning digital assets. I think that's something important to talk about. I want to focus in on what is happening in the UK. Uh, there's some, some talk about blocking uh, digital assets, and there's some conversation coming out, maybe more specific towards derivatives, but still, there's a little bit of a concern uh, when they start talking about it. Uh, then they, I pulled up an interesting article uh, regarding uh, Bitcoin and digital assets ever being banned in the, uh, in the U.S. And that's a big open question. And I think it comes out to be a resolute no. Um, but what I wanted to start out with today is Christine Lagarde. And the reason why is because it seems to be a conversation that comes up over and over and over again. Um, and I know DNI uh, talks about Christine Lagarde uh, quite a bit, especially when it comes to uh, IMF. Uh, your money, you don't even know it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you're like that big bear, and she's like this little bunny rabbit, and you're with these, bear, these claws, and you don't even know what to do with these claws. <laughs> um, uh, let's see here. Um, so, anyhow, so Christine Lagarde, and, and, and so... You know, do we really know, you know, who each individual person is? You know, you, you, you look at what they're doing in the space. Um, you, you look at what they're doing for, let's say, the, you know, in this case, the IMF. Uh, but what I find is interesting is where is the allegiance? You know, where is her allegiance to? Um, and, you know, one of the, the points here is that now she's being offered a position to head up the European Central Bank. So, Maybe, maybe yes, maybe no. He's done a good job at the IMF. He's brought the IMF attention to the world stage again. Obviously, the IMF, when it comes to corruption and, and, other, uh, and other incidents uh, globally, as do many of these uh, non-governmental bodies as well as governmental bodies, especially if you look at like the United Nations and, and a lot of the, uh, really a lot of, a lot of the different uh, groups that spin off of the United Nations uh, have, have uh, you know some underlying uh, corruption in, involvement? Now, when we look at at, at uh, Christine Lagarde, what was interesting? This came from a conversation that I had with uh, Chip uh, uh, yesterday or this morning. Kind of continued this morning, uh, and he huh, her allegiance is to Brad Garlinghouse. Uh, yeah, so so he shot me over this article, which I thought was interesting. So we start off with you know who is Christine Lagarde? You know, what is she doing? It's kind of a silly article on Market Insider. Goes to her rolling her eyes at Ivanka Trump, who's trying to talk to some of the key business leaders. You know, is she looking down on Ivanka Trump? I don't know. You know, that's not really the point. Uh, but here, what I thought was interesting in this article is that here she's being nominated for the European Central Bank, and she has zero experience in monetary policy and is not an economist. Is that important? 
you know, I don't know if it is or isn't. Uh, but, you know, what is interesting is that, you know, right from the European Council, and this is from this Market Insider uh, article, he's thinking that she's the perfect candidate uh, to be president of the European Central Bank. So I'm reading through this article. I said, okay, you know, that's what they want to do. In the meantime, you know, Chip sends me another article from 19, uh, from 2016, and the headline is what stuck out. The headline of the article was, Christine Lagarde convicted, IMF head found guilty of criminal charges over a massive government payout. Now, obviously, a lot of things get, uh, you know, swept under the rug. Yo, what's up, DNI? I'm glad that you made it on. Uh, awesome. Uh, hopefully you had a, a safe trip. Hopefully you had a great trip. Um, and uh, glad that you're, you're, uh, you're logging in. So wasn't sure if you'd be streaming at 9 o'clock. Meant to get on earlier. Was planning a 30-minute, 30, uh, 30 45-minute uh, early stream. Uh, but glad to see you uh, logging in there, DNI. and i so, you know, so, we, so we start digging in you know, through, uh, through this article. And, and it, it, it kind of struck me a little bit that, you know, that articles like this kind of get buried. But it also strikes me that, you know, from my perspective, you know, I'd want to do a little bit more digging. I want a little bit more understanding um, and really understand, you know, who this individual is. But at the same time, you know, when you see her being moved into another position of power with the European Central Banks, then we also want to understand, you know, what is behind all of the movement. You know, was she truly, uh, uh, she was, she was convicted, held guilty of negligence, but she wasn't fined and she wasn't, uh, she didn't face uh, jail time. So it, what's interesting is what were there certain powers, uh, you know, that actually that, you know, put her in a position uh, to where she was then, you know, found negligent, you know, or was she negligent on, you know, on her own? Uh, and now is she truly uh, the best person for the job to head up the European Central Banks? I think there's a lot of questions. Um, and it's interesting how, you know, how important critical facts get swept under the carpet and don't get brought up again. Um, however, you know, when we look at it also, um, and, and just kind of digging through this, but her negligence, she was guilty of negligence for failing to challenge the state arbitration payout to the friend of former French president, Nicolas uh, Sarkozy. Now, obviously we know what happened with Nicolas Sarkozy uh, and you know a lot of issues with him. Uh, but what's interesting again is that it, her negligence to challenge uh, a payout. So, you know, I don't know. I, you know, it's amazing to me that if she didn't challenge it, you know, they were paying out, you know, why were they, why was this, uh, you know, the state arbitration payout happening? Why was she responsible to, to, uh, 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 to actually challenge it? And then if she's, you know, found guilty now by, you know, some form of negligence due to her role, uh, it's crazy. And at the time, uh, uh, she was, let me see, Ms. Lagarde, who was a French finance minister at the time of the payout in 2008. So she denied any negligence. So she's saying it's not her responsibility, yet the court still held her guilty uh, of this, and but with the zero punishment. I don't know. I just thought it was an interesting article. I thought it was something interesting to talk about. I thought it was something interesting to bring up. And since DNI is... Uh, is around here it would be interesting to get some feedback from him as well and see if he's uh dug in and and looked into this uh at all as well any further so just thought i would bring that up and uh something that chip had uh, shot my way so uh so next next thing that i wanted to talk about on the list here um which is the uk so and this was an interesting article because it popped up on the guardian and what really struck me on this one was that the uh, Financial Conduct, Conduct Authority, um, let me see, is he uh, streaming there? I don't know if he's streaming or not. Um, but the, finan the Financial Conduct Authority says crypto assets are ill-suited to small investors and very uh, volatile. So this is the FCA. I think, you know, it's interesting to me, interesting to me because you know, when you see the government, um, that's all right, DNI. Uh, that's that's cool. So we're gonna stream and then uh, I'll shoot everybody over to you here uh, shortly. So this is gonna be a short one. I have a few things that I wanted to cover and we'll get everyone over to you, DNI.
So I know he's probably already uh, streaming. So, um, you know, so you know, when you when you see the government or you see a government organization uh, talking about a, you know, a, an investment that is now ill suited to a small investor, um, really, whose responsibility is it when you're investing? You know, and we saw a similar kind of dialogue uh, that were, uh, you know, you know, that we saw a similar type of dialogue that were coming out of, you know, some of the fudsters, whether it was from Forbes or from, you know, some of the banks or, you know, from some of the others that were in the space, you know, when, regarding the U.S. Um, and they were talking negatively about the investor as though the investor's not small, uh, smart enough to really decipher whether or not a, an investment is appropriate for what they want to put their money in. And I find that, you know, to be extremely, you know, difficult to swallow that, you know, some government official is smarter than I am um, and can make better decisions with where I want to put my money uh, than I am. So, you know, as, as you get into this article, though, and it, it gets very, very insulting. You know, so here you have the UK's markets regulator <clears throat> has proposed a ban on financial instruments linked to digital uh, cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin, warning that such products could cause huge losses for retail consumers unlikely to understand their risks or value. So their, their focus here, again, they, then they go on and say crypto assets uh, that are ill-suited to small investors. Uh, they, I just highlighted a few uh, key points here. Extreme volatility, the difficulty in valuing them. Uh, consumers patchy understanding what they were buying and the increased risk of financial crime. So, you know, it's just, it's just crazy because, um, you know, who, you know, who are they to make these decisions? And why did they say the small investor or oh, the, the small retail investor just isn't intelligent enough, can't decipher the financials because it just seems to be, you know, it's above them. It's too difficult for them to value it, too uh, difficult for them uh, to analyze it. Um, you want me to drop a link on this one? All right, this is an interesting article. It's on, in The Guardian. Hang on. Let me just, I'm going to throw it right into the uh, chat conversation. Hang on a second. Uh, where'd it go? Hang on. All right, I might get a little, uh, little bit of a lag, but here you go. Boom. See if it goes in the, I don't know if I can get it in there. Hang on. Ah, it's not letting me, uh, it's not letting me po uh, paste it. If I can't paste it. What I'll do, I'll throw it into the description. Uh, but for some reason, it's not letting me put it in to the, uh, into the, uh, into the chat. Um, I'll put it in the description when we're done. I'll put a link to this article. I'll put a link to each of the articles if you want. The one from 2016 regarding Christine Lagarde. And there's a couple other really interesting articles uh, that we picked out. You know, this one I thought was great. You know, so this one, you know, goes down. They talk about, you know, the, the amount of uh, loss that an investor may suffer. So they're looking at, you know, all these, you know, sudden unexpected losses if they invest in these products. You know, obviously, if you're investing in a derivative, uh, you're taking a risk. If you're investing in a volatile investment, it could be a digital asset. It could be a stock. It could be a startup business. It could be whatever it could be. You know, again, is it government's responsibility uh, to, uh, you know, to tell you that? You know, that, and that just, you know, it's just extremely insulting. So from their perspective, they said estimating a ban would benefit consumers to the tune of between 75 million and 234.3 million a year. That's per this article. Now, again, where, you know, how did they even come up with these ridiculous numbers? You know, obviously there's people in the retail space. I know it. I know that, you know, if you want to try to get into margin trading, you want to get into these derivatives, you want to get into these high volatile, high risk stocks, uh, investments, you know, don't do it. You know, you know, it's, it's individual prerogative. Now you could say the same thing about casinos and gambling, you know, and, and let's ban them all over the place, you know, and there's casinos, unfortunately, but that's high risk, high volatile. And the, and the, you know, percentage chance that you're going to lose is relatively high, you know? So, you know, it's kind of crazy to me, uh, that, you know, that, you know, they're, they're going to really kind of address something of such importance with, with such, you know, I, I don't want to say animosity, but again, it's so, it's so belittling, uh, the way they do that. And again, we saw the big banks doing the same thing. Appreciate that, uh, XRP Carolina. Anybody, 
uh, new to the space, if you haven't been on before, definitely subscribe. You know, throw up some thumbs up uh, if you're if you're just getting in. Um, now, here's another one. Most consumers cannot reliably value derivatives based on unregulated crypto assets. They're saying that prices are volatile, and they keep focusing on financial crime in the, in the marketplace. Due to financial crime, the crypto asset market uh, can lead to sudden and unexpected losses. So what is this with a financial crime? Again, why, why are they using scare tactics? First, they're trying to belittle, then they're trying to use scare tactics. You know, and, and again, the whole focus here was really derivatives and, and uh, exchange traded notes, uh, not, you know, almost like an ETF. But then, it, then you're saying, okay, so that's all they were focusing on. But then they come back again and they say, uh, one of the FCA's concerns is the volatility in the price of digital currencies with fluctuations in the value of Bitcoin proving a pri prime example. So they just talk about derivatives, but now they come back and they belittle us again by you know talking about their main concern is because the digital currencies are volatile and that you look at the price of Bitcoin, but they, they're, they're narrowed focus. You know, so they're only looking at a little snapshot. So the snapshot that they're looking at is what happened this week. Uh, Bitcoin fell $10,000 on Tuesday, down 30% from the week's peak. So what? So it fell from 14 to 10,000. But if we want to look at the full length and term of this investment that went from basically zero uh, to 10,000, that's a pretty that's a pretty big growth. If we want to look from last year uh, to this year or two years ago to this year, you can have ups and downs in the stock market also. Let's look at some of the stocks that are down. Let's look at GE stock. GE used to be riding high around $30 or $40. Now it's sitting around $6. So what happens if you bought GE stock at $40 and now it's valued at, at $6? You know, isn't that volatile? You know, now if the six goes up to nine and then back down to six, we could say that was volatile. You know, there's too much volatility in GE, you know, for me to want to invest in it, you know, because the movement is too extreme. It used to be $40. Look, now it's $6. Well, yeah, the company's going through a, a hell of a time, you know, but if we're just looking at a little snapshot, if we're, and if you're not talking about what happened, so here they're not identifying what happened. And that seems to be a trend article to article. So it shows you the naivete or the, you know, the fact that many of these writers in these articles don't really understand or don't want to take the time to really explain what's happening in this space. And it, and it kills me, you know, because, you know, as we go to mainstream uh, in, in Main Street uh, investment, uh, these are the articles people are going to be reading. And these are the type of concerns that people bring to me. And one of my good friends is constantly in, in conflict. Oh, Bitcoin, it's going to go away doesn't have any understanding with it, but yet he wants to send me all the articles like this that, you know, show that obviously the digital asset space is problematic. You know, so here's, and the, these, this isn't just, you know, uh, unique for this specific article or like Lawrence Gracie said, UK being a nanny state, you know, because this is, you know, similar articles that we've seen in Forbes and Bloomberg and others, they have this similar kind of uh, theme that goes on with it almost like you know this is the fud that they're trying to that they're trying to spread to really dampen you know our mood on on investment so you know and and then they take it a step further in this and this is also just the same kind of fodder that they want to you know spread and this is you know it has a history of wild swings and some analysts say it could rise back to 20,000 again or fall as low as 3,000 yeah that could be it's definitely possible um you know so some analysts but then they have to highlight in late 2017, it nearly reached 20,000 before a spectacular collapse in 2018. Great. Again, narrow focus. We're only looking at the past year. Granted, you know, a lot of people came into this space at the height and, it, and it, it's probably, you know, it's very difficult, you know, but, you know, we we're looking at this whole trend of the market. You know, and, and there's so much movement. Let's look at it, you know, from a macro perspective. Instead of just zooming in with a little microscope and only focusing on a segment, let's look at it the bigger picture. Let's talk about the technology. Instead of saying, oh, these fluctuations, let's pull back and look at the market as a whole and say, okay, two years ago, you know, Bitcoin was at, 
whatever it was. I don't remember the number. Uh, maybe someone can look it up real quick. Say year to date, where was Bitcoin two years ago? Uh, and where is it today? Huge difference. You know, penny stocks like Alex Yeet is saying, uh, ETH, you know, 250, uh, you know, down to 13. Um, you know, there, there's, you know, things are, are all over the place. You know, I mean, that's just, that's the reality of it. Um, you know, so we have to, we have to take everything in perspective. And unfortunately, many of the FUD spreading articles don't bring anything into perspective. So we don't know exactly what's going on, you know? So let's see, Vepro, I know that social security thing I've been paying into won't be there. Exactly. Talk about, you know, volatility and high risk putting your money in, knowing you're going to get zero return. You know, it's kind of crazy. So then I took a step and I said, okay, but how, how are things looked at in the U.S.? And so fortunately, there was an article that just happened to uh, uh, pop up here yesterday. And this, the title of this was The Overlooked Reason the United States Would Struggle to Ban Bitcoin. And I said, this is a perfect counterbalance to what's happening over in the U.K. So the U.K., again, that article with the FCA, they're focused primarily on derivatives, but they're still belittling the entire market due to a misunderstanding. So although they might be focused on derivatives, their real intent is to try to ban all digital asset. You know, that's in their mindset. And you can tell it from the language, you know, but whether it happens or not, that's another question. Uh, so then we look at the U.S. And I thought this was really interesting. This article I found on Forbes. Um, and what I, the reason why I wanted to highlight this is because they interviewed the CEO of Abra, uh, this guy, Bill uh, Barheit, I think you pronounce his name. And the reason why I thought this was interesting is because, um, I'll, yeah, I'll throw it up. Um, yeah, you can't, it, won't, it won't let you post it in the chat. So I'm hoping I can post it in the description of the, of the, uh, of the video um, afterwards. So, so this is this is really interesting why you know and and this is one of you know one reason why why uh digital assets can't be banned in the u.s and i really thought it's interesting because again this is coming from a perspective of someone in the space but this is the abra ceo and and the key point here bitcoin is a free speech issue now that exists in the united states we have free speech in the united states the way he's using uh, and identifying it as a free speech issue is interesting, um, but that's but that's one reason why he says it can. Have, there's obviously a lot of other technical reasons. There's a lot of background as to why uh, it's not going to happen. Um, obviously, we're seeing what's happening in government and the and the the goal and the drive right now with the Token Taxonomy Act and others and the outspoken and you know within Congress and what's happening over in uh, Wyoming and what's happening in Nevada, what's happening in Ohio and what's happening in other states as they're addressing this digital asset space. This, this whole space wouldn't have built up the way it has uh, if the governments are, their real intent at this point is to try to crush it, regulate it, control it, direct it, but crush it, it's not gonna happen anymore, it's too late. So, um, but here's what, you know, again, Bitcoin is a free speech issue. One of the key reasons why it can't be banned uh, in the U.S. So he really focuses in on the legality aspect of it. And it's important when we're talking about a government trying to destroy or ban it uh, to then focus in on the legality aspect. So I think that's, you know, really interesting and, you know, really important. You know, so, um, you know, let me see. I'm trying to find the last uh, statement that he had. Um, and, you know, we ended up here. Free speech needs to be a protected human right across the board. Um, but I'm trying to find what, you know, it was a perfect uh, sentence here. Let me see. Um, no, okay. All right, anyhow, so, but it, it's interesting. You know, it's really interesting. It's something that, you know, I hadn't really, uh, you know, thought through that part of the process yet. So um, let's see here. Now let's move on to the next one. And this is what I kind of wanted to wrap up with because, we talk about utility and utility is the driving force. Utility was what's important uh, from a blockchain perspective. We know that the utility is there. We know what Ripple is doing with RippleNet. We know they've rolled out X Current. We know that X Rapid is still somewhat in the works, you know, somewhat being implemented, um, but it hasn't been rolled out the way uh, everyone antici anticipates it. 
to be rolled out because we know that's the big game changer in RippleNet versus Swift as the Swift 2.0 because that is the game changer that they have the trio, you know, that they have the X current, the X rapid, and the X via, that that's what makes RippleNet so unique and different. We know that R3 is, is has imp, uh, implemented XRP as part of Accorda. So we know that the digital asset aspect of the blockchain is valuable and important. Um, but when you see it in practical use, uh, this is where you know that things are, are starting to, uh, to really move. Um, whether it's XRP or you know, Bitcoin or Ethereum or Litecoin or whatever it might be, we know that utility is bringing about the driving force towards mainstream adoption, mainstream in every, in every sense, whether it's enterprise, whether it's uh, to the retail, uh, to the consumer in everyday life or a government, it's, it's now being ingrained into our everyday uh, life. Now, this is interesting because this uh, article, this is on Cointelegraph, had to do with uh, the first successful blockchain track shipment from South Korea to the Netherlands. I thought this was awesome you know, because they're tracking the shipment, but not only did they track it, every part of that shipment was on the blockchain. That means communication. That means the tracking of it. That means the payment of it. That means everything was on the blockchain. And this is huge. The fact that they were able to accomplish it and it was successful to have a container ship with goods that was tracked from one port to the next and it was done with transparency um, and successfully uh, is amazing. So this was, um, let me see here, uh, Samsung SDS, Dutch Bank, ABN, AMRO, and the Port of Rotterdam jointly conducted a proof of concept shipment from South Korea to the Netherlands. So this is, this is awesome. Now, here's what happened. So uh, it was tracked via the blockchain platform they called Deliver, um, and it allowed for the shipment to be instantly financed fully tracked and conducted paperlessly. So finance, the financing part of it is important, you know, especially if it has to do with an exchange of payment for a good ship. Uh, 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 seller ships goods, buyer has to pay for goods. Typically there's tons of people involved, paper involved, banks, third parties. Uh, there's all these things that are involved in that payment process as we know. And if it's done by letter of credit, if it's done by uh, by uh, uh, you know uh, uh, a global uh, cross-border payment, you know whatever it was done with, if it's you know normally used with Swift, you know you have all these things that are going on. And here, exactly like Rock Roberts said, instantly financed. So it ships, it's tracked, and boom, hey, the ship's on its way. Boom, well, I got our money. You know how amazing is that? I mean that that to me is what this is all about. And the fact that they're doing it for real. You know, actual real life stuff is much more interesting uh, than, you know, the fictitious. So, and, and here it is, real life, uh, super efficient. And what did this CFO say uh, from, the, from the Port of Rotterdam? The traditional process of shipping is usually paper heavy and inefficient. You know, so, and he said here, for instance, an average 28 parties are involved in container transport from China to Rotterdam, 28 parties. And here they did it with three, three. The blockchain platform deliver was reportedly, co oh, no, sorry, co-developed by three partnering organizations and is in an interoperable platform that supports Ethereum and Hyperledger. Sorry, it didn't involve three, but it involved, you know, much less, uh, you know, uh, parties than the, than the normal 28. So, so anyhow, so that to me is, is just amazing. You know, and then here's here's what we had here. Uh, the customs clearance blockchain system at the Korea Customs Service is based on a hyperledger fabric, while Rotterdam Port Netherlands is using the Ethereum platform. So, hey, that's cool. You know, different platforms. We started the deliver project to connect different platforms. That's exactly what's needed. You can't just have one platform. You have to have, and that's why we talk about, you know, XRP being the bridge currency. You know, what they're doing with RippleNet. You know, you need a bridge between all these banks. Inevitably, people like McDonald's or they like Burger King, they like Coke or they like Pepsi. That's the reality of it. That's the nature of it. So when you have that kind of a mix and then in that scenario, um, you're going to have different organizations that are using uh, different solutions. And so, you know, to me, that's amazing, you know, 
And so the fact that they were able to develop a solution that can now interconnect uh, different platforms is what it's all about and is, is you know, again, super, super uh, meaningful. So that's what I wanted to talk about tonight. I thought it was really important. Um, I wanted to get on a little bit earlier. My plan is to is to try to focus in on that eight o'clock time spot uh, for streaming. We were streaming at 10. 10 o'clock is sometimes a little bit difficult. We're fluctuating here between uh, eight and 10, uh, but I don't want to step on DNI's uh, toes any longer. Really appreciate everything he does. Um, want to make sure that uh, I want to, you know, give a shout out to everybody on the stream. I want to give a shout out to XRP Carolina uh, for being first on and getting some uh, free XRP that was shot over to him. Um, and, you know, I want to appreciate everybody else that uh, participated and joined in the stream and, you know, and, and, and sends their voice, you know, through, uh, through this chat, you know, to participate. So really awesome. Uh, appreciate all you guys. Have an amazing evening. Uh, have an amazing uh, 4th of July. What's up, Andrew Nation? Just getting ready to sign off. Uh, but, you know, definitely, you know, have an amazing 4th of July. And I'll see you guys uh, probably not tomorrow. Uh, but I'll check you guys out uh, uh, maybe Friday night if you join the Auburn, uh, you join, get on to Rain, uh, check him out. I might be on Friday a little bit earlier if I can manage to get on 8. If not, I'll definitely be on uh, Saturday at 8 a.m. Um, so check you guys out then. 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, by the way. Um, that's it. Have a good night. Check you guys out later. Let's end this stream. I'm going to try to use my out. Let's see if it